Well, hello, good morning to you. If we haven't had the chance to meet, my name's Matt, and I'm our Strawbridge Campus Pastor. Uh, good to be with you if you're at one of our campuses or online. Thanks for being here today. And if you are at one of our other campuses at Strawbridge or Norfolk or online, and you're seeing all of this behind me, uh, like Jason said earlier, here at this location, it's not a new summer set design for Grace Bible Church. We've got summer's best week coming up. Can we give it up for summer's best week again? And yeah, if you have a uh, like incoming, I believe kindergartner through incoming sixth grader, I'm pretty sure I said that right now, like in the, in the coming school year, summer's best week is for them. And we're so excited that that's happening this week. All right, y'all, we've been in this series uh, on the book of First Corinthians uh, for like a year. Like, it's been a while. Like, you read it, you look at it in your Bible, and you're like, it's not that big, right? And uh, we are, the light's at the end of the tunnel, folks. We are almost done with 1 Corinthians. We're gonna be in chapter 15 today. It's, uh, chap- there's 16 chapters in the book overall, but chapter 15 is the theological conclusion, uh, apex of the book. It's the climactic part of the book, and we're gonna begin in that passage today. And I don't know, it'll probably take another year to get through the chapter. We'll see what happens. Uh, but if you're new to the Bible, or if you've never opened a Bible. Man, so glad you're here. You're, you're, the Bible that, that, that Christians have is, is a collection of 66 books. First Corinthians is one of them. It was a letter written by a guy named Paul to a church that he planted in a city called Corinth that was in modern day Greece. It was a port city, very actually similar to Hampton Roads with people coming in and out. And there's a church that Paul planted and they're just trying to figure out how to follow Jesus. And Paul writes a letter to them, giving them wisdom on how to do that, how to follow Jesus in the the midst of a culture and a world that does not. And we're gonna continue to, to go through that today as we come into chapter 15. But before we do that, I want, there's something I want you to think about. I want you to think about this. Is there something in your life that maybe you've tried really hard uh, to accomplish or maybe you're currently trying really hard uh, to accomplish? And if we're just being completely honest, it's never gonna work out. Like, oh yeah, to church today. Come to church for some encouragement, right? Like, you excited about that? Okay, let me fall, fall on my sword here. For, for, there was somebody over here that was like, oh, oh, okay. Uh, for me, the, the thing that I've tried really hard to do, that if I'm just being completely honest, it's never gonna happen for Matt Love, is just be absolutely jacked. Like, buff, swole, all, whatever word you wanna throw on it, it's just never gonna happen. I was really tiny growing up, uh, and even into my young adult years, uh, but then I moved to Hampton Roads like six years ago and y'all got, got all this good food here. I became a dad, so I started getting the dad bod thing going on. And I tried everything I could do to put on pounds growing up because when you're tiny as a teenager, you fit in a lot of lockers and girls don't wanna go on dates with you. And so I tried everything I could uh, to, to bulk up, to, to even put on any weight. I worked at McDonald's for a year and I ate there every time I worked there and I lost weight. That's scientifically impossible, I'm pretty sure. That doesn't make any sense. I took PE twice one semester, not because I had to, because I needed to, because I was trying to put on, I hired a personal trainer that yelled at me, he made me cry. And it just, it was to all no effect. It just never, it just never, it just never worked out. So I've embraced the dad bod life now, it's comfy, it's comfier than being jacked, so I'm, you know, I'm okay with that, I'm secure. And I still go on runs and eat a vegetable from time to time. Um, but is there something that you, you have in your life that you've just tried and tried and tried, but it's like a hamster wheel. You spin, you spin, you spin, and you go, and you go, and you go, and it never gets anywhere. And maybe you felt that way about following Jesus. Does following Jesus actually work? Does it actually move your life somewhere? Does it actually change you? Does it actually help make your life better? You know, maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time or you've called yourself a Christian. You can't remember a time where you didn't identify as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus. But sometimes you wonder, did I just maybe win the birth lottery? Like maybe you were born into a family that followed Jesus and so you're like, they, they do it, so I'm gonna do it too, right? But if I was born somewhere different, would I, would I be different? Or if I never made that decision or if I went my own way and didn't believe what my parents believed, would I be different? Or maybe if you're being completely intellectually honest, you're like, this doesn't make any difference. This doesn't mean anything. You're here today, maybe just to get your family off your back, your spouse, your parents, whatever it is, or maybe you show up here every single Sunday or, or you, you crack your Bible every single morning because it makes you look like something you're not. And I don't mean that in any sort of judgmental way at all. I know it might sound like it, but 
Let's just assess maybe where we are before we move forward. Maybe you would call, you would call Grace Bible Church your home, your, your home church. Like this is, this is where you go to church. When people say, where do you go to church? You say, Grace Bible Church is my church. But you don't believe in God. Maybe you come to Gravity on a Wednesday night because you're a high school teenager and you come to Gravity on Wednesday night because you heard there were cute girls there. Or maybe you go to Common Ground as a young adult on Thursday nights or maybe you're involved in our local outreach efforts like for our schools uh, because you know it's important to make a difference in the community. You love what Grace Bible Church does, but Jesus, you can take or leave because is he really gonna make any sort of difference in your life? And I think today Paul is gonna speak directly to all of that to all of that. He's gonna present to the Corinthian church and to us this thing called the gospel. You may have even heard the gospel before. Maybe you haven't, and that's okay. The gospel, it's not just good music. The gospel is this word in the Greek that literally translates to good news. It's good news. And it's often used to describe what Christians would say is the foundational and core teaching to their faith. Now, I grew up in church, and man, am I so grateful for that upbringing. Um, but if, so if you're anything like me, maybe you've heard this gospel before, time and time again, and it's stayed in here, but it hasn't come out to here, to your life. And I think that's what Paul is gonna invite us to today. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, chapter one. He says, now brothers and sisters, I wanna remind you of the gospel I preached to you, when you receive, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. Otherwise you've believed in vain. When Paul says that you received the gospel, what he's saying is you didn't just come up with this. You got it from me. And unless we think Paul is full of himself, in just a few verses, he's gonna say the same thing about himself. He's gonna say that he received it. He received it from Jesus. What Paul's saying is the gospel, the thing he's about to talk about, it ain't a man-made idea. It wasn't like Paul was sitting around, had good tacos one night, was like, hmm, the gospel, that's a good idea. That's not what Paul's saying. He received it from Jesus himself. And then he actually went and confirmed it with other apostles and disciples and people who knew Jesus. Like, do I got this message right? And they're like, yeah, you got it right. And he goes and he, he preaches the gospel and tells people about the good news of, of Jesus. Now, and so he's saying, I, it's not, it's not man-made. Now we know from other parts in 1 Corinthians that there was a lot of false teaching. There were people going around to other er, like early Christians and saying, hey, this is actually the gospel. This or this is the gospel or that's the gospel that were different gospels than what Paul had, had preached to them, had, had taught them. And so Paul, Paul wants them to know, hey, there's one gospel. And if anybody is to preach to you a different gospel, it's wrong. You need to hold tightly to what I'm saying to you, what I am, I'm telling you. You need to hold firmly to this truth and reject all other forms of truth. Now, here's where we need to take a little bit of a time out and pause and talk about how we think about truth. Because Paul's talking about truth in this very close-handed, like, hold on to this one thing and reject all other forms of, quote, unquote, truth, because they're not really truth. They're lies. They're, they're deceit. We especially today, can take that type of thinking to an unhealthy extreme that Paul wasn't talking about. Like, for example, we've gone through 1 Corinthians and we've seen that there are passages where even people who love the Bible and love Jesus, forget about people who deny Jesus' very existence, people who love Jesus and love the Bible disagree about some of the stuff that Paul's saying. And so Paul, um, but Paul seems to be saying here, hey, hold tightly to this. And so here's where we get to the very difficult tension that believers and, and followers of Jesus have to wrestle with. Recognizing that you need to be open-handed about a lot. You need to understand that there's gonna be disagreement and that um, I'm gonna have opinions and I should be very careful about calling those opinions truth, Right? And I need to be humble. I'm not the owner and arbiter of truth. And even when I come to scripture, I'm always gonna interpret. I'm always gonna um, come to it with my filters and my own understanding that might influence the meaning I take from it. We need to recognize that. And we need to hold that with intention with passages like this where Paul says, hey, this is the gospel. This is the truth. And we need to be careful to not go to either extreme because if we go totally open-handed on everything, then truth is relative and it's not even, then it's not even real. And then if we go to closed-fisted, my version of truth, then we reject our own interpretations or re reject the fact that we are interpreting things and we close ourselves off. And so here's where we kind of sit in that tension. But Paul says, when it comes to this, when it comes to the gospel, 
this is what you hold firmly to. So here's um, what he says. He says this, for what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And so any, this is biblical interpretation 101. Anytime you see something repeated in scripture, it's not like Paul fell asleep and forgot that he wrote it and so he wrote it again. That's not what he's saying. He wants you to pay attention. And so we see according to the scriptures twice in this passage because he wants you to pay attention to it. Well, when, we, when the New Testament says scriptures, more often than not, what it's referring to is um, the Old Testament. 1 Corinthians is widely regarded as one of the earliest, if not the earliest, New Testament book. Again, it was a letter, but we call it a book uh, written, written around 50 AD. So it can't be referring to other pieces of uh, like letters and gospel accounts that may have circulated later. It's referring to the Old Testament scriptures. And so when he says that Jesus died according to the scriptures, there's two possible things he could be referring to. One is pro like there's direct prophecy um, about Jesus' death and resurrection in the Old Testament scriptures, specifically in the book of Isaiah is where a lot of them are found. And so you can look and say that the book of Isaiah, which is we can prove and date, was written hundreds of years before the life of Jesus, and it predicts the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That's pretty fascinating. But what I'm actually maybe a little bit more convinced by is that uh, and this is another, again, interpretation that according to the scriptures refers to the Old Testament story of God's people in a lot more broad terms. That ultimately the Old Testament is a true story of God's people waiting for good news. And the question is, what good news were they waiting for? Because today we can really reduce the good news to somewhere you go when you die. We can think that that's all it's about. And that's part of it. And Paul's gonna talk about that later Paul wants to make it really clear that there's something more important at play here, something bigger, something even better than that. Because the Old Testament people, the Israelites, they were waiting for good news, and the good news they were waiting for is that God would come to them and restore them in the land that they were in, on earth. And so when Paul says that, uh, G, like according to the, the scriptures, Jesus died, according to the scriptures, he bookends those, that, the gospel with those two with that one phrase two times, he's saying that Jesus coming is the fulfillment of that hope, of that good news. That, uh, your gospel, that the gospel, the good news, guys, it's not a retirement plan. It's that Jesus is with you, that he came to be with you and he restored you to right relationship with him right now. That's part of the good news. But the second part of the good news is the more controversial bit. In fact, there's a word in this passage that I think is the most controversial word in all of scripture, that Christ died for your sin. Sin. Jesus dying for you will mean absolutely nothing to you if you don't know why he had to die. If you don't know what you needed to be rescued from. Paul says it's sin. He died for your sin and man, does that word pack a punch today? I think part of that's human nature. Who likes to be called a sinner? No, no one, right? I don't like that, you don't like that, no one likes that. No one likes to be called that, but I think part of it is also because of being fair and trying to be equitable as we talk about this, is because that word sin has been used in some pretty awful ways to abuse everybody from small children to the masses by religious leaders is trying to get their way and everything in between. And so I think before we move on, we need to talk about it. We need to talk about it because there's people here today who I know that's your story and that's part of what, how, you, how you got brought up and it can be a triggering thing. And so we wanna, we wanna assess it. What is sin? Let's talk about what is sin first. I think sin is two things and we need to think about it in two categories. The things we do and the state that we're in. Sin is both the things we do and it's the state that we are in. Let's talk about that first category. Sin is the things that we do. Sin is anything that you do, act upon, think, or say, or whatever, that is contrary to God's will. It's any action that is contrary to God's will. If I lie, then I'm sinning. You go to the Ten Commandments, and this is the easiest way to explain this. It says, do not lie. 
Okay, pretty clear, right? If so, if I lie, then I've sinned. If I commit adultery, if I sleep with someone else other than my wife, or I cheat on my wife in any way, shape, or form, then I've sinned. If I um, steal, then I've sinned. If I take the Lord's name in vain, then I sin. That's all sin. It's any action that we commit that is sin. The sin is the things that we do. But here's what's really important to remember: is sin is also the state that we're in. It's both and. Paul says in the book of Romans, another letter that he wrote to a different church, um, that uh, all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. The, the, The beautiful thing, this is gonna sound like maybe sacrilegious, the beautiful thing about sin is it actually creates equality among us before God. It creates an egalitarian society before God. That ultimately we all fall short and no one's better than the other which is why this word should never be used to shame someone, should be never used to hurt or to harm. By people in power, by parents to their children, it should never be used to shame, to hurt, or to harm. Because if sin is just the things that we do and not the state that we are in, then it becomes a competition. And some can be better than others. But we can look, and we can look objectively at the world and say that there are some people who do more good and some people who do more evil. There's a difference between Mother Teresa and Hitler, right? But sin is not just the things we do, it is the state that we are in. We all sin and fall short of God's glory. And I, I, I wanna take this as an opportunity to say that, like, that's weird for me to say because I'm on a stage and a platform and like, I know for me, there's the subconscious thing that when you look at people who are on a stage and a platform, your brain does this thing where you think that they're literally elevated above you. And let me just make it really clear. I suck. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I am depraved. I am just as sinful and fallen short of God's glory as you are. And if you've um, struggled with church people because they seem like they think they're better, they're not. There's not. They're not better than you, and you're not better than them. We all fall short of God's glory. We all do. And so it's important to think about sin in both of those ways. I have friends who have a really hard time with this. Understand, I have a friend who, um, she grew up in a nice southern church-going family, and by all appearances, everything was, was great, was great. But behind closed doors, it was an abusive household, both verbally, emotionally, and spiritually. And every time, I'll give you an example, every time she did something wrong as a child, her parents would just beat her over the head with this word, sin. You're just nothing but a sinner. You're just a no good sinner. I found, I, I found someone in the lobby, someone came and found me in the lobby after the last service and said, my parents told me I was the devil's child. I was just nothing but a sinner. And she heard this over and over and over and over again, this friend of mine, and she just felt so much shame, understandably so. And she grew up and left her home and very quickly left her faith in Jesus behind. And so I was talking with her a few years ago and just processing through this with her and trying to, to, to understand her perspective. And she no longer believes in Jesus or, or any of that. And she was telling me this. She said, she said Matt, what if, what if I can be my own God? What if I can be good on my own. And you see, my parents told me that I was nothing but a sinner, and that's you know, kind of how she started to view God, that that's the way that God thought about her, that that's all she was. She was just the devil's child. She was you know, just a sinner. And she's like, Matt, what if I can be good on my own? What if I don't need God? And that's the dominant worldview when we deny our sinful nature. And there's a lot of work being done in the scientific community, the the philosophical community. Sam Harris is a really well-known atheistic voice in the world who's who's like, if you're a Christian and you wanna like really, like he's got a lot of good stuff and good challenges that are like important questions to know how to answer. But he would say, we can be good on on our own. We will develop enough morally as history goes on. Sure, there will be some road bumps along the way like a crusade or a Holocaust, but eventually as history progresses, we will get better and eventually we will figure out how to be good without God. D.A. Carson, a really well-known theologian, um, has this great quote where he talks specifically about the Holocaust and, and human nature, and I think his insights are valuable. He says, one of the significances of the Holocaust is that it was done by Germans, not because Germans are worse, not at all, 
but because before the Holocaust, just about everyone in the Western world thought of them as the best. They had the best universities, they had the best technology, and they were producing some of the best scholarship in the world and were leading the flock in so many ways, which is another way of saying that the nation at the philosophical peak of Western Enlightenment values led us into genocide. And when he refers to, when Carson refers to the Enlightenment, he's referring to a period of history in the 1700s where, um, th that was called the Enlightenment period where he, mankind kind of took human reason and put it on this pedestal and said, human reason is the highest um, form of good, that, that ultimately it's the highest value in any society is human reason. And there was a lot of good things that came out of the Enlightenment. There's a lot of good things about philosophy and science. Please don't lump me in with those people, right, who say philosophy and science are bad. Like, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, and what I think Carson is saying, is that not that philosophy and science or any of those things are bad. All truth is God's truth. Let's not be afraid of it when we find it. It's that those things, devoid of an acceptance of our sinful nature, will only lead us to be the worst versions of ourselves. In other words, if I take all the good things in God's world, but don't know that I'm limited, fallen, and sinful, I'll actually become the thing I'm afraid of, the worst version of myself. Christopher Watkin, not Walken, that'd be pretty cool, but Christopher Watkin wrote a book called Biblical Critical Theory that I highly, highly recommend. I'm like halfway through it right now. So far, there's nothing heretical, but he says this in, in his chapter on sin. To deny our wretchedness is to imply that humanity's current condition is as good as it gets, and that is a truly wretched thought. Has sin been used to abuse and to hurt and to harm? Yes, and I'm so sorry if that's been your story. But that's never the way the biblical authors talk about it. And that's good news. Because ultimately, the way that they talk about it is that it points to something else. It points to something that's beyond it, that engulfs it, that destroys it. And his name is Jesus. And, he, and this is where Paul gets to the, the heart. For I am the least of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And by his grace to me, and, or, and his grace to me was not without effect. Paul wasn't not love trying to get buff you know, on the hamster wheel and it wasn't working out. Paul says, no, God's grace actually did something in my life. It changed me. We can go to the next slide. No, I worked harder than all of them, but yet not I. It didn't matter. It was the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. Paul is gonna get into in just a moment uh, what happens when you die. And, and he, this, this verse one through 11 is the setup to a much larger argument that he's gonna make. And it'll blow your mind just in the next few weeks. But Paul wants you to know that the good news is about now. It's not just your retirement plan. It's actually about your present reality. Paul says the grace of God changed his life, that his life actually looks different. And his awareness of sin did not lead him to shame. I'm so sorry if you were beaten over the head with sin, sin, you're just nothing but a sinner. You're the devil's child. I'm sorry if you heard those words. I'm sorry if people beat you over the head with that and expected you to do something about it because you can't. That's not good news. That's not good news. The good news is that you, that me, that we are sinners who Jesus loves so deeply. That is the good news. And the biggest sources of sin and shame in your life are actually the biggest opportunities for God's grace to work. And don't miss this. He wants to do it. He's excited about it. He doesn't look at your alcoholism and think, not again. Typical. He doesn't look at your sexual addictions and say, not again. Typical. He doesn't look at your lies, your deceit, your envy, all of these things that exist in me as much as they exist in you and think typical. He says, there's an opportunity for my grace to work because I love them. I love them. He died for you so that you could see that he brings dead things to life, that he doesn't scoff at them, that he doesn't 
try to manipulate, that he loves you, that he loves you so deeply. He's excited about transforming your brokenness, which you and I both know is there, no matter how much you try and pretend like it doesn't exist. And here's the best part of the good news, is so often we reduce the gospel to forgiveness. Like it just brings you back to neutral, to baseline. God's grace is about forgiveness, but the good news is better than that. It's about transformation. And it's about change. It's that you can actually be different. The way that I like to put it is this, is that God's grace is just the inverse of your sin. Paul, in his sin, murdered Christians. With God's grace, he built churches. In, in your sin, are you addicted and hiding that from people you love and they don't even know? With God's grace, you can bring that into the light, you can confess that, and he can actually change your life to where you help people overcome those addictions yourself. With God's grace, with God's grace, are you lying, steeding, and cheating, and cheating in your sin? With God's grace, you can be known as a man or woman of integrity. Here's where this hits me. My words, I'm just angry. And my words can hurt and harm, and they can take up a room, space in a room in the worst possible ways, and roll over people, defenseless people. But with God's grace, I can be known as gentle and kind. So my question for you today is this. Where do I need to acknowledge the grace of God? It, spoiler alert, it's everywhere. But, <laughs> but today, how, I'm all about wanting to make it just, a, what's a next step? What's a next step? What's one area of sin and shame in your life where you need to acknowledge the grace of God? You see, Paul had to acknowledge that the thing he had devoted his life to was wrong. And we all have to come face to face that, with that reality, that the way that I've been living is contrary to God's will. And, but I don't have to be ashamed of that because it's everybody, and Jesus loves me. So I would summarize the, the gospel with two words. It's this, sin and grace. And your sin should never lead you to shame because of Jesus. It should lead you to humility. And grace should lead you to believe that change and transformation is possible. Your job, my job, is just to accept with open hands. God, I accept your grace. I accept that I'm a sinner, and that because of you, I don't have to be ashamed of that, but. I can accept your love and watch you change my life. And today, if this is particularly striking you for the first time, I wanna give you an opportunity to begin a relationship with Jesus for the very first time. If you've never realized, man, I am a sinner and I, and I need to accept the free gift of grace that God has given me, then we wanna create space for you to do that. I'm not gonna make you do, I'm not gonna make you stand up, oh, me, like, I'm not gonna do that. Our unofficial model here, he, motto here is don't be weird, so I'm gonna try and do this in the, the least weird way possible. In, in your seat back in front of you, you, if you're at Strawbridge, you, it was on your seat when you came in, you have a Connect card. And on that Connect card, there's an option on there that says become a follower of Jesus. In just a moment, I'm gonna pray, and if you're not gonna do this, even if you're not gonna do this right now, just bow your head and close your eyes with me. And if you wanna make this decision, you can quietly grab that Connect card now and we'll, we'll pray and we won't you know, do anything to, to draw attention to you. And you can fill out with just as much information as you're comfortable and check that box and you can leave it on your seat um, when you leave or you can hand it to a blue shirt on your way out or guest services, whatever you're comfortable with. But I'm gonna pray and give you space to do that while I pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy. Thank you that you love, that you love me. Thank you that you love us. It's so undeserved. It doesn't even become close to describing how undeserved it is. Words cannot describe, but God, you choose it. You give it to us. You give us grace and mercy. I pray for anybody here who's been hurt or harmed by man trying to twist sin in some sort of power move and that they would see your loving embrace now and that they would know how much you love them. You care about them and that you see them for all their flaws and all their weaknesses, and they would know that they're loved. Pray that we would all live out of that space, and that we would be known as people in Hampton Roads of deep compassion, the same compassion you've given us. In your son's holy name, amen.